Hi everyone, welcome. And today we're going to go through some Viva practice with Siak. So, hey Siak, um, you were with me at Western Health for quite a number of years. And where are you up to at this stage? Yeah, look, I'm in my final year doing my rural rotation out at Ballarat. Yeah. Um, and thank you very much for having me along today, Lahiru. No, no problem at all. Hey, so let's get started. So, I mean, our Vivas, there's eight Vivas, 15 minutes each, two minutes reading time. And uh, often the stems these days are really long, and I've just made this as a modification of the original stem. We'll get into exam mode, and we'll get started. And here is the stem. Can you see that okay? Yep. Fantastic. I'll give you a couple of minutes now, but you can get started whenever you feel. Mm -hmm. See, so that's probably about two minutes. Sure. Um, actually, before we get into it, what kind of stuff did you do in your two minutes of reading? Sure. So I break down each stem into uh, patient pathology, procedure, place, and then uh, if it's a paediatric viva, I think about the parent as well. And then I have a right-hand column that deals specifically with answering the question itself. Mm -hmm. um, and so in this case, I spend the last couple of seconds specifically not on the stem but imagining in my head how i'm going to answer well two questions in this case yeah go on and just to run through this again uh patient place pathology procedure um, so uh, patient pathology procedure place and if it's a pediatric uh viva i think about the parents as well beautiful you know one of the extra thing i add on is personnel but as, as part of the who do i need kind of referral thing as well uh, yeah let's awesome get, let's get started so as you as you come in they'll say uh, hi candidate number whatever uh do you understand the question i do fantastic so please uh answer the question what is his risk of renal impairment preoperatively and what criteria can be used to define acute kidney injury so i would deem this patient's risk of renal impairment to be high because he has multiple comorbidities that put him at increased risk as well as surgery that compromises flow to the renal uh, vasculature. In terms of criteria used to define acute kidney injury, I can use the rifle criteria, which is based upon the creatinine, urine output, and then the time at which uh, there is abnormalities. Good. Tell me more about the rifle criteria. So there are five um, specific stages of the rifle criteria, risk, injury, and failure, including the, uh, the end-stage renal failure. In terms of the uh, criteria for each, I can't remember the exact amount. I believe with the risk, it's one to what two times, the injury two to three times and failure greater than three times the baseline creatinine. And urine output, it's related to, uh, I think the key numbers are less than one mil per kilo per hour, less than point, sorry, less than 0.5 mils per kilo per hour. There's a duration associated with risk of injury and then anuria um, and the duration with regards to how that pertains to the end-stage renal failure. Now, yeah. when we're talking about the overall risk, you mentioned this was high risk, um, and you mentioned the patient themselves and the operation. Can you give me some more detail about the patient and the operation, why you think this would be high risk for renal impairment? Sure. Starting with the surgery itself, it's a triple A procedure, and it says it extends above the renal arteries, so there's going to be no flow to the kidneys during that period of time, and it's we. And the uh, perfusion of the, of the kidneys may be reliant on any um, collaterals that are, that are existing. With regards to risk factors, we know that type 2 diabetes is associated with pre-existing nephropathy uh, and as is uh, hypertension as well. Mm -hmm. Anything else? And with, and with increasing advanced age, this patient, I believe, is in his 70s, mm -hmm. um, kidney function um, already uh, decreases as you age, and this puts him at increased vulnerability. Anything else in this patient's history? And I might show you the slide again. Oh, there. Is there anything else there that you believe will increase his risk? Mm, smoking will increase the risk. Uh, uh, extends above the renal artery, hypertension. I guess uh, TIAs. 
may indicate uh, existing peripheral or existing vascular disease. And this, in, in addition, increases his risk of renal impairment. Yeah, great. Anything else? Any, uh, uh, based on any of the information there? What do, what do you think of his? What, have you, what do you think of his medications? Well, in terms of his medications, um, uh, sorry, go, taking oh, a look right. at it. Yeah, no, that's all right. <laughs> mm, taking a look at his medications, look, an ACE inhibitor can cause uh, transient hyperkalemia, but that's only when it started. Metformin may be associated with lactic acidosis. <laughs> yep, that's um, right. Yeah. Let's move on from there. So you mentioned the rifle criteria. Um, okay, now on assessment of this patient, you find you do your normal anesthetic assessment. His exercise tolerance is greater than four mets. He has no ischemic heart disease history, and you see this blood panel here. So I'm just going to show you that. So HP 100, platelets 200, sodium 135, uh, potassium 4.5, creatinine 80. Proven hold valid with no antibodies. Maybe take a quick screenshot of that just to help you along sure. with these slides. Uh, all good? Yep, all good. Beautiful. Now, <clears throat> what does your preoperative preparation include for this patient? Okay. Um, the major issues uh, for, uh, are related to the patient and the surgery uh, itself. So it, with regards to the patient, uh, I'd want to assess the severity and stability of the overall uh, conditions and then look to optimise this uh, preoperatively. And with the surgery itself being a triple A essentially, I need to, our priorities there would be to um, prepare for uh, significant amounts of bleeding, potentially a massive transfusion, and also prepare to look to optimise this patient to prevent uh, injury, particularly to the kidneys, uh, the spine, um, ischemia to the peripheral limbs, and then potentially prevent any TIAs as well. And so that would be uh, where my uh, preoperative assessment and, and uh, lay. So okay, with regards... Let's, let's focus on the patient then before we get on to the surgical things that you might consider. Yeah, how do you want to prep this patient in terms of optimization? Sure. The significant findings that we see here include uh, anemia. And so we would want to optimize these hematinics prior to the operation because we anticipate significant amounts of blood loss. Um, in addition, we'd want to measure, uh, concentrate on the type 2 diabetes, ideally getting his HbA1c less than 9% then screening for macro and microvascular complications for which we could um, optimise. We'd want to optimise his blood pressure preoperatively as well. And I note that he's on clopidogrel and we need to rationalise that prior to the operation to minimise bleeding. So going back to anemia, uh, in further detail, I want to investigate the cause of the anemia and I'd, so I'd want to take a blood film and do a, uh, a panel which includes TFTs, B12 and folate. Uh, coagulation. Let's, let's say you do um, that. Iron uh, studies. Let's say you yeah. do that. That's fine. That's good. Iron studies, TFT, Foley. You're looking at all the screening tool, and it looks like it's just iron deficiency anemia. And you institute. What would you give for iron deficiency anemia? So I would give uh, a dose of uh, IV iron. Uh, I would give it eight weeks, ideally, before mm -hmm. the procedure, and check that his HB uh, had recovered. So I would aim for an HB greater than one thirty prior to the operation. Okay. Good. Keep going. So with the type 2 diabetes, I'd want to further investigate with it, as I said, with an HbA1c uh, and liaise with the endocrine uh, team with regards to optimization of his type 2 diabetes. Again, I'd screen him for micro and macrovascular complications, though I note he's got no previous ischemic heart disease, but he has had previous TIA. I'd want to find out a little bit more about the TIA. When was the last TIA episode? The uh, ongoing residual deficits, the treatment that he'd be on and the response to the treatment itself. Ideally, we want um, to only operate on this gentleman nine months after his last TAA to, uh, to minimise perioperative risk of stroke. Mm -hmm. they would, and um, autonomic neuropathy would be my other major concern with this gentleman uh, and therefore we'd want to do lying and standing blood pressures uh, and look to see if we could optimise that by liaising with um, 
it is endocrine taint. Good. Let's yeah. say no, no issue with lying and standing blood pressures. Um, the surgeons are very concerned about this aneurysm. It's just that large and they want to crack on with this. Uh, so mm-hmm. this, this time, this time frame is, um, actually let, let's say this time frame is nine months post the TIA. Um, clopidogrel, he's on for the TIA, no residual def- defects. Uh, mm-hmm. anything else you want to optimize? So, <clears throat> uh, we talked about blood pressure. Um, uh, also, um, when we talk about uh, hematinics and preparation for a massive blood tra- uh, preparation for significant bleeding, there needs to be extensive discussion in the setting of this patient being a Jehovah's Witness. Great. Uh, we, we'll, we'll come to that in a second. Anything else in this history you can optimize? Blood pressure control, we could talk about um, smoking. So, uh-huh. uh, with regards to his smoking, um, uh, we need to try to encourage this gentleman to stop um, and um, and uh, we would use that as per the ANSCA profession document using right. an ask, are, advise refer. What yep. are the pr- principles of smoking cessation paraoperatively? Smoking cessation, uh, as I said, can be divided into ask, advise uh, and refer. So with regards to ask, we need to ascertain this patient's readiness to stop and in this I'd be encouraging him uh, to stop for uh, the benefits of reduced perioperative uh, risks. Um, I'd have extensive discussion uh, privately, and if he was open to it, I'd then uh, refer him on. To, uh, I'd have a discussion with him and his GP about ways in which we could prevent this, and this would include pharmacological and non-pharmacological methods. Fantastic. So you have yep. the farm and there's, I guess, psychological non-farm, and you're interested in that. That's all good. Anything else you want to change and optimize here? What do you want to do with the medications? So with regards to the medications, we need to cease the clopidogrel uh, preoperatively, yep. uh, ideally seven days before, but we'd be liaising with neurology yep. uh, prior to. You could consider stopping the metformin a day before the surgery and with regards to the ACE inhibitors. Uh, look, there are some. Um, what would you do? I would, con- I would continue the ACE inhibitors right. preoperatively. Metformin, you're ceasing one day before, is that right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Day before the operation, uh, day of the operation. Sorry, yep. Uh, is there any any advice for stopping the metformin sooner than one day? Yeah, so you uh, sooner than one day. Uh, my understanding is uh, increased lactic acidosis twenty four hours uh, cessation prior. That's uh, the, I thought the recommendation, but I'd have to liaise with endocrinology to check. Yeah, good. Okay, let's say. Uh, You've, you've talked to the surgeons. They've got a they've got a plan for the surgery. You're happy with that. You've optimized this patient. What is your anesthetic plan for this uh, suprarenal AAA? Okay, it's going to be so, over. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, uh, with my aims of uh, preventing uh, significant blood loss, but also providing uh, adequate surgical access, uh, my overall uh, plan would be a relaxant uh, general anesthetic. I would have an arterial line in um, preoperatively. I'd induce this patient with um, uh, with uh, with propofol, uh, one milligram per kilogram, uh, fentanyl, two hundred mics, and rocuronium, one point two milligrams per kilogram, with a metaraminol infusion, uh, aiming for a map plus or minus the baseline. In addition to all plus of that, or minus, I, plus or minus what the baseline. So plus or minus 10% of the baseline. Mm-hmm. I'd want to have um, two large bore IV accesses in situ. I would place a CVC when the patient was asleep. Um, other medications and uh, equipment that I'd need ready is Norad infusion uh, ready. I'd want uh, the cell saver uh, prepped and ready and a rapid infusion device with two units of packed red cells in, the, in an adjacent fridge. Or if that's not possible, I'd want it in the room. Um, in addition, I'd have a discussion with the surgeons about um, early notification of bleeding and uh, 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 and with and look to instigate a multimodal uh, analgesic regime. What is your analgesic plan? My analgesic plan can be divided into uh, systemic and pharmacological and non-pharmacological. But here, we're predominantly looking at pharmacological basis, systemic and regional. Systemic would include. 
uh, paracetamol one gram QID. I'd have uh, fentanyl two. Uh, I anticipate uh, is using uh, two to three mics per kilo in divided doses. Ketamine at point one uh, milligrams per kilo per hour. And I'd have a chat to the surgeon about putting in tap locks for the midline incision at the end of the operation with catheters and an ongoing vapivacaine infusion in ICU, which is what I anticipate this patient is going. Yeah, good. Any other parts of this procedure that you want to manage? Yeah, so in addition to obviously having the noradrenaline, this is a super renal AAA. And therefore, during clamping, I would anticipate significant hemodynamic um, alterations, and I'd want to plan and treat for those. Oh, yep. Yeah. And how? What, what do you expect and what are you going to do? Yeah, so what I'd anticipate is that um, during clamping, particularly uh, there's going to be an increase, sudden increase in blood pressure and increase in contractility. We'd want to ensure at this stage that um, that uh, this isn't excessive and then treat appropriately. And for me, it would be with small doses of propofol and deepening the anaesthetic in the first instance. Second line treatment would be with GTN. Uh, we would want to uh, then continually monitor. How do, you, uh, how, do you, how do you make up GTN? How do you run it? Yep. So for me, for this operation, um, I would have both IV boluses and then, um, and then an infusion running. So for boluses, I put 50 milligrams in 500 uh, mils, and so a mil is 100 mics. And in the acute setting, I would give a half to one mil, so 50 to 100 mics. If an infusion was required, which I don't anticipate, it's usually transitory, I'd use three milligrams in 50 mils and started at one mic, uh, per, one mic per minute, which is one mil per hour, and titrate accordingly. Just, just yeah. clarify that again. What was your dilution of the GTN? In your so, so for boluses, so I have oh, sorry for the infusion. Oh, so three milligrams in fifty mils of normal saline. What does the GTN come in? So the GTN comes in the fifty milligram uh, bolus. So point yeah. six is three milligrams. Yeah, so you take point six mil out. Is that yep, right? and you yep, and put it in fifty mils. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, okay. So let's say this the surgery goes ahead. Um, the surgery is complex and the cross clamp is actually on for two hours. What are you concerned about? So I'm concerned about um, decreased perfusion to the spine, kidney, and then the uh, lower limbs causing ischemia. Um, and I, I think this needs to be communicated to the surgeon. However, there, there may be um, benefits uh, to this. So that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, yeah, anything else? You mentioned... Uh, you mentioned spine, you mentioned kidneys, you mentioned low limb lack of perfusion. What, what is, what's the implication of that? Uh, the implication of that is increased risk of ischemia, increased buildup of metabolites, and it means that during release of the clamp, we may get an exaggerated uh, response as well. In addition to that, uh, I guess other organs that could be compromised would include the splanchnic uh, vasculature. Exactly. Let's go back to exaggerated. What, what does that mean, exaggerated response? Sure. So um, with increased time of clamp, there's increased anaerobic metabolism of the lower limbs, which means increased buildup of, um, but, uh, of, of potential toxic metabolites such as uh, lactate, uh, which when released have an exaggerated vasodilatory effect. Um, there's increased potassium. Yeah, good. Um, How do you yep. prepare for unclamping? Yeah, so the pre preparation for unclamping, I would divide into hemodynamic and electrolyte disturbance. So um, what I would do throughout this operation, we're aiming for euvolemia. So we need to ensure that appropriate MAP, tar MAP targets are met. So uh, continual fluid uh, infusions. Um, we would ensure that the blood pressure was uh, slightly lower. So I would say a MAP, uh, sorry, slightly higher. So I would say a MAP plus 10%. So uh, anticipating a drop post unclamping and then i'd also in take an abg prior to unclamping to ensure this patient was hypo was not hypokalemic i'd aim for a pay between three and four um, if we were significant worried which i am in this case we could tell the surgeons to do a progressive staged unclamping giving us back one leg and then the other so to speak to minimize the hemodynamic and electrolyte disturbance okay any, anything else you prepare for before they unclamp? Mm, prepare for lactate, 
uh, electrolyte disturbance, yeah. uh, hemodynamics. What do you prepare for the electrolyte disturbance? Yeah, so, I mean, what I would prepare for uh, if there was hyperkalemia, you know, I, I, I could uh, anticipate this, or if there was hyperkalemia, we could uh, get an insulin dextrose infusion uh, drawn up. Um, uh, but I tend to, what I tend to do is, is ensure that there is no hyperkalemia and um, if uh, take serial ABGs uh, post unclamping and treat uh, with uh, treat with fluids and then insulin dextrose if it is excessively high. Now, as you unclamp, you, let's say this is a monitor screen rather than ECG, but you see this on your monitor. Take take lead two as your example, maybe. Uh, what is this, and what do you do? Yes. Um, this is a high, yeah. So this is this twelve lead ECG is highly concerning. Uh, the significance. Uh, the significant uh, characteristics include uh, peak, excessively peaked T waves. What, what is along, it? Uh, so uh, this is uh, hyperkalemia. So it's yeah, a broad, complex tachycardia. That, that's yeah. fine. It is hyperkalemia, and it looks pretty severe. What do you do? Calcium. Uh, so this is an emergency. Um, I call for more help at this stage, communicate this with the surgeon, tell them to stop unclamping. Uh, I would, in the first instance, give calcium. Uh, 10 mils of 10% uh, calcium chloride uh, via the uh, CBC. I then um, look to give this patient a dose of 50 mils of 50% dextrose and then 25, uh, 25 units of, sorry, 10 units of uh, at rapid. Uh, I'd then be starting an insulin infusion uh, and taking serial, uh, serial ABGs. Um, I think in the uh, second instance, we'd, we'd be aiming to see a resolution uh, in ECG. Um, you, 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 in do ECG. you do the insulin dextrose, you give in the calcium chloride, you take an ABG and the potassium's actually at eight still. What do you, what okay. You yeah, so uh, other things that we can do um, is, is to increase the insulin infusion, uh, insulin dextro and uh, insulin dextrose infusion rather, uh, and we would also uh, instigate uh, salbutamol, uh, IV, and Lunch. so I'd have to look at uh, I'd have to look up um, at, in a, in an appropriate reference. Any, any, anything, sure else, anything else you could give that you know the dose of <clears throat> in a hurry? Any, um, other things that we could give uh, to reduce the potassium includes frusamide. So I give forty milligrams of frusamide. Anything that's going to work immediately. You may have mentioned this before. You said, I, I heard you say insulin dextrose, calcium chloride for stability, and then salbutamol. Is there another yep. one you give? Um, uh, we talked about frusamide. We talked about um, bicarbonate can be used. Yeah, how, um, much, how much bicarbonate would you give? Um, so one mil per kilogram is okay. how much I would give. As you start treating this, uh, one mil per kilogram, one millimole per kilogram, which probably comes yes, out. Which, yeah, which is one mil per kilogram for, of eight point four percent bicarbonate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you see the monitors alarming as you're instituting this treatment. Um, the blood pressure is now sixty, heart rate mm -hmm. is one hundred and fifty. What are you doing? Systolic blood pressure sixty, heart rate one fifty. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, concerning. I'd look to confirm this reading. Uh, by ensuring the transducer is at the appropriate level, communicate mm -hmm. this to the surgeon. Mm -hmm. I'm really concerned about bleeding uh, at this stage, uh, but there Let's is see, a wide... You see this hyperkalemic trace. It's very fast. Blood pressure's dropped. Ble everything looks normal from the unclamping, except for your problems. Uh, okay. Um, okay. So um, I look to temporize this situation by giving this patient a 500 ml bolus of normal saline um, and um, giving this patient uh, 0.5 milligrams of uh, methraminol as well. I'll be, in, I'll be taking a look at the ECG, uh, looking at the particular morphology uh, of the patient, you know, whether it was a primary arrhythmia as opposed to secondary to another uh, cause, looking at the end title uh, CO2 as well. Um, I think in... Uh, then I'd consider my likely differentials at this stage, which 
you know, for me at this stage, include patient anaesthetic and surgical. Let's um, say you're doing. Let's say you're doing this. You've given aramine minimal minimal effect. You're running the norad. You're given fluid, and you keep topping up the aramine, but you're still not getting much above seventy. Um, what do you think is going on, and what are you going to do to solve this right now? Sure. Um, and and I just want to. Uh, so I'd have a chat to the surgeons again, ensure that there's no bleeding. There's no bleeding. Uh, yep. Um, with regards, so I think there might be a. I'd want to take a look at the ECG, looking for a primary arrhythmia. I think no arrhythmia. Probably, it's sinus tachy, but super, yeah, super peak T waves. Right. So there's ongoing hyperkalemia. Uh, that would be uh, my ongoing differential. I'd mm -hmm. take an ABG to clarify this um, again. Yep. And comes if back it was, at eight. Yeah, it comes back at eight. So again, really disturbing. I give another dose of calcium at this stage. How do you again, get? How do you get this blood pressure back to safety? Um, so, ongoing fluid resuscitation, increasing the noradrenaline, uh, mm -hmm. and resolving of the hyperkalemia are my overall thoughts about resolution. Any of other this. way that you can get this blood pressure back to a safe amount? So just imagine, uh, you, yeah, you got hyperkalemia. It's probably causing bad contractility. Blood pressure's tanked. It's very hard to resolve. It's very hard to treat this. Is there yep. one thing that you can do or someone can do that can just sort this out while you? Uh, so, I mean, hemodialysis is not going to sort it out. Uh, in terms of uh, what we could do, we could... Uh, Fluid replacement, we've talked about blood. Could you ask uh, the surgeon to do anything? Yeah, I guess so. We could ask the surgeon to reclamp the aorta, and that would. Um, yeah. Let's say you, re you reclamp and you've now got some semblance of a normal blood pressure, you get the blood pressure back to 100. Your potassium's still super high, and you've got this real conundrum cross clamp increases potassium, but you know, you're only shifting it. How could you? solve this tricky situation and what's your dilemma sure yeah so the dilemma is uh so the conflict uh is as you described uh overall my priority would be to get this uh would be to reduce the potassium uh and in to do this uh i guess if uh i would look to again um Repeat the doses of uh, calcium, uh, insulin dextrose, fruzamide, uh, bicarbonate. But if refractory, we would have to consider hemodialysis in this uh, patient. Fantastic. Yes. Uh, and they're there. Hey, Zach, well done. Okay. <laughs> How do you feel? Uh, so, uh, look, like I looked, put, got put through the ringer, but thank you very much. Uh, difficult situation, always no, that's really right. sort of, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've done an, I have done an open AAA, luckily, but, yeah, that's... Uh, didn't say that, so that was uh, really good, really good. First, first of all, so again, obviously Survivor, I'm making this as difficult as possible with every, it's it's like I have a series of, you know, anesthesia worst case scenarios, and this is definitely as bad as it gets. And it's good. So your knowledge is on point. Like, you know, you're giving me good values. You you know mentioned rifle, rifle criteria. I'm going to say that the overall, there's only one thing I need to give to you is that I want you to get to the point far quicker. Um, which means less ambiguity in what you say. Like you'll, you'll definitely say a statement like, um, for me, for this operation, that's wasted words, just say sure. what you're going to do, um, because it is always on the assumption of, for me, for this operation, in my hands for this operation. Just I want you to get rid of words because you'll get through it quicker. Yep. Um, things like, I think you meant, you, you're doing good technique in terms of, you mentioned the drugs you'd given the doses. You mentioned calcium and the dose. Fantastic with that. And then other times you would say something, but not give me the detail of it um, quick yep. enough. So that 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 was, for example, anesthesia plan. I want you to be able to just go, yep, this is going to be a general, relaxed and general anesthetic with endotracheal tube, art line, and CVC asleep, as well as uh, thinking of my pain plan, which is you know opioid based fentanyl, multimodal and ketamine infusion, and I'll talk about tap blocks at the end. Maybe you want intrathecal morphine, you mentioned that as well, whatever. Yep. I want you to get through those things far quicker, especially the easy stuff, because you know how to... It, it really did sound like you've done a AAA. Like some people, sometimes when I ask this kind of stuff, it feels like they're just winging it and it they, they haven't done it. Mm -hmm. um, then in that 
I'll, I'll go from the start now. You, you you took it in your, I really like what you did in your two minutes, you know, have an answer and a structure for the broad things. So that was great. Um, you answered the, you mentioned the risk of perioperative renal issue in categories and you paused, which is great. Then you went to answer rifle criteria and without knowing the detail of rifle, you like, I, I like that you knew, like, I like that you knew what it was about urine outputs and creatinines, you know, risk, injury, failure, loss, end stage. I'm just going to put this up on the screen, actually. Uh, so interestingly, oh, yeah, so I just, I've just put in here, patient for my framework for the risk, which you covered pretty well, um, is that. Rifle yep. criteria is this. Yep. And this straight from the, C, the BJA Education Series article on this. Um, yep. And even though you didn't get the exact numbers, and I did push you on it, um, you, like you, you knew broadly, it, it, you answered the question in a way that makes me feel comfortable because you gave me some stuff, some broad stuff, even though you didn't have the detail. You know, like I would say, if if there's any criteria to learn for renal stuff, definitely memorize this. But you know, if you don't, you can't know everything. And you gave me a good answer, so I was happy with that. I wanted you to mention what L like loss and and yeah, stuff, but, but that that's all right, not not a big deal. Now I wanted. As soon as you said what is his risk, then pause. It'd be good to follow on with the stuff. The patient stuff is this, this, and this. The medication stuff is this. The hemodynamics of the surgery. So to divide it into those things and then then start going to some list without prompting may be good. I'm not an yep. examiner, so I'm not exactly sure. I probed it and you gave me really good answers. <laughs> that was just from that same article. Oh, yeah. potentially um, about all the different things. Um, I gave you this information. And, you know, you, 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 so I, I essentially with this one, I, I felt like I was kind of getting things out of you. I feel like for this, I wanted you to list things. For example, I feel like there's things I could optimize from the operation point of view, surgical with, with discussion with the surgeon, as well as a patient and your ability to kind of go in and say, I want the blood pressure to be controlled, HbA1c 9% or less with good BSL control. Um, and then ensure that the hematologist is okay with the uh, with the TIA cessation of clopidogrel, any residual symptoms. I would, you know, can't really modify his BMI, BMI in a hurry. I can cease the I can cease the um, smoking. Hopefully, I really like that you knew the ask, advise, refer framework. What was that? What was that framework? I've, yeah, ask, advise. Yeah, refer. ask, advise, refer. Yeah. And then yeah. you knew the non-farm farm detail. That's great. If you know, we could go into that in another viva. You know, that's that's a whole thing. But you knew it, which is fantastic then Jehovah's Witness and all the things. So I did feel like I was kind of trying to get it out of you. I would suggest to give that list based on what you see there. You got all the information here, just say the list and then start talking about the detail. So I'm not wondering if you're going to come up with that. Oh, I see what you mean. Yep, gotcha. Yeah. So how would I say it? There's perioperative stuff and surgical stuff to optimize. This includes his uh, you know, medications, his, sm his smoking, the fact that he's Jehovah's Witness and his, and his meds. <laughs> Um, yeah. and then go to these old, his, his, um, past history optimization is this, this, and this. So, you know, you've given the snapshot, they can probe whichever aspect they want to probe. Mm -hmm. Um, and you mentioned anemia and optimizing that, I, you know, I like the, the detail you gave me with that, which is great. Um, cool. And then the consent for the blood you mentioned, I didn't go into that again. That would be a whole other thing. Um, I wanted you to mention in the plan. I, I prompted you for this, but the biggest thing about this for me is the clamping, unclamping, especially if it's a difficult case. And I wanted you to mention that and I'll be prompted about that. But, you know, once you, once I mentioned it, boom, you were, you were, you know, really good with cracking on with that. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, this is where some of the vague things came up. You mentioned uh, metabolites oh, because, you know, I want to hear potassium. As soon as it's two hours, that's going to kill you. So that's mm -hmm. what I want to hear straight off. And then preparation yep. is, yeah, warm fluid load, increased norad. You had specific values, 10% above normal, fantastic. Get the calcium in. And I, th that's the other thing. I, I wanted a very, because this is two hours, I wouldn't be relaxed about it. I would be like, yep, yeah, take the ABG before, expect badness with potassium maybe, and then have everything ready so you're not worried about it. Like if you had said, I would look up the salbutamol dose at this point and get it ready, then you get the marks. Whereas a lot of people don't know the salbutamol dose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, fair enough. That's, gotcha. how, that's how to play that game. Um, then what's that? So yeah, hyperkalemia. Uh, so you, I feel like you knew the answer to this. And again, if you know the answer, I highly recommend. I think this is severe hyperkalemia. You went the other way, which is 
kind of more methodical, which is completely fine. But I'd say because you knew is hyperkalemia, get to the answer, move on. Don't give me methodical. Give me methodical as a backup. I think there's yeah, sure. hyperkalemia, and I would look at the OBS, I'd look at the vitals, and then start treating this um, and take an ABG. In more detail, this ECG is this. They're not going to want more detail because you've given them the answer to a complex question. Yep. Um, hyperkalemia, rapid treatment, re- and this is where I'm getting at. Like anytime you get bad instability, uh, you know, I've, I've seen one terrible hyperkalemia. Uh, I've, I've just put in the fact that the human diet is stable with the level of hyperkalemia that it's going to affect contractility and whatnot. But mm-hmm. just know that at the end of the day, you, you you know you do everything you can, but at that blood pressure, you try to treat it, and then you got to reclamp in discussion with the surgeon. It, 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 is is that? I mean, you've done a triple A more recently than me. Is that how you'd see that normally? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it was, um, yeah, I guess, look, you're absolutely right. In terms of um, now that you say it, mm. uh, correction of the signif- uh, the hemodynamic uh, perturbations, essentially, very close clamping would cause your yeah, systolic blood pressure to increase, essentially. I guess I was just, I, I, I was particularly fixated on how you correct this refractory hyperkalemia, but that's oh, yeah. um, just something good to know. I didn't yeah. realize, yeah, yep. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If you get bad enough hyperkalemia, your heart muscle is not going to function. Look, this is probably talking a little bit out of experience. Like I haven't seen hyperkalemia that that bad as this ECG would show, and mm-hmm. I haven't seen the hemodynamic effects of it. So I'm kind of making this up a little bit, but in theory, right. this is possible, and I'm giving you the scenario. So it's it's kind of not exactly 100% fair game, but it's 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 50% fair game, let's say. No, uh, I think it's fair enough. Yep. Cool. And then um. Then I look the one instance I, I recall. This was terrible, you know, emergency AAA hyperkalemia. Every time we put the, uh, it wasn't my case. Every time they put, take, took the clamp off, hyperkalemic arrest, reclamp, redistribute with sodium chloride, insulin dextrose, whatever, get the patient back. But every time they re, un, re un, you know, unclamped, the patient would just arrest again. We they weren't they weren't able to fix this problem, and I kept thinking. I wasn't. I wasn't part of the decision making. I can't pretend to know any or the full detail. I suspect they said this is a palliative or futile case, but I was thinking, what would I do? And it would be well. I guess the only way I can take away potassium is hemodialysis. This is really tricky, and I've got very little experience with hemodialysis. But that's the question I'd ask. I didn't go to much more detail, but I like that you mentioned that because lot you were thinking logically. I need to get potassium out, and yep. you know, zonium and furosemide isn't going to do that quickly no. enough. So hemodialysis is probably the only option. Mm. Um, yeah, that's that's about it. See, any questions about that? No, no, no. That was really, really good, uh, Lihiru. Thank, can you? Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for watching and listening. Um, thanks so much for seeing. Like you did such a great job, especially under pressure and knowing you're going to be recorded. Now, if um, yeah, please share with anyone who might be interested in this kind of material. Again, this kind of stuff is what happens in real life. And it's really good to you know think about it preempt it and prepare for it, especially for our final exam in the australian system um and yeah if you want to be viva for your exam please reach reach out to me um, i'll be happy to give you viva it'll go on youtube and it'll help a lot of other people for their exams and for real life so see you next time thanks very much for watching now what's new with abc's of anesthesia is that we're forming a whole bunch of very comprehensive courses for every stage of your anesthetic journey from medical student to procedural skills from foundations in anesthesia as well as really important exam lectures and clinical anesthesia courses as well